Okay, good afternoon, boys and girls, and uh, let's go get back to uh, chapter one, exploring life and science. Now, the second portion of this uh, this chapter deals with the scientific method, all right? And I'm going to begin this with a YouTube video from uh, Mr. Paul Anderson, who is a high school uh, AP biology teacher uh, out in Montana. I'm going to show you a bunch of his videos uh, over the course of the summer because um, he is a um, he's very much more talented than I am at making these stupid things uh, and his animations are much much better. So uh, in order to see this I don't think you're going to be able to click on the link through the video uh, but I have posted the PowerPoint that you're watching so that you can actually uh, uh, download it and uh, click on this link while the PowerPoint is playing, and that will give you the ability to uh, watch Mr. Anderson's video. Okay, so let's talk about um, the scientific method here. What do we know about science? What is science? All right, well, when I was a student at Siena many, many moons ago, um, we defined, or we there was there were these little posters and pins everywhere that said science is a verb at Siena. All right, too many of us think about science as a noun. It's a it's a subject we have to study in school. It's a requirement that we need to uh, you know fulfill before we graduate from Siena. All right, but in reality, science should be an action word. All right, because it's a way of knowing about the world around us. All right. It's a way of exploring and learning about everything that goes on in the world and even the universe around us. Now, um, science and scientists should be objective. All right. We know that they are not always. All right. As a matter of fact, um, any time that you that a scientist is being paid by a company or government or anything else, you should immediately probably ignore what that person is saying. All right, or at least explore um, the uh, the motives behind what the person is saying. All right. Um, let me also say at this point that anytime you hear a politician, um, and it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're talking, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, it doesn't matter. Anytime you hear a politician talking about science, you should immediately turn off the radio or TV or whatever it is and just ignore it completely. All right, because they're all morons. Now. Um, science and scientists are objective by definition. The scientific method is objective. The truth is what matters, not your own uh, political motivations. Scientific conclusions um, can also change or be modified as our understanding or our technology increase. Um, there's nothing wrong with being wrong in science, okay? And especially if new evidence comes up uh, at some point that shows that the original hypothesis was wrong, that's okay, right? Because a good scientist will say, oh, yeah, all right, well, and then ask the next question, okay? And so science is studied using a tool called the scientific method. Now, um, in, in the scientific method, we start out with the idea of observation, um, where we look at something that's occurring in the natural world and we ask ourselves, hmm, why does that happen? We then may do some uh, background research or, or ask ourselves a few simple questions and come up with what we call a hypothesis. And this is um, a, a testable statement, something that we can um, conduct an experiment in order to, um, to uh, determine um, whether uh, the, our answer is correct or not. We then perform an experiment um, which, in which we test the hypothesis and we come to a conclusion, all right, that our hypothesis is correct or our hypothesis is incorrect. And again, let me stress that a hypothesis, a hypothesis that's proven wrong is just as valuable as a hypothesis that's proving proven correctly, at least to a good scientist, because a scientist wants to know the truth, not, uh, you know, not try to, to uh, advance himself or his own uh, reputation or that sort of thing. 
Now, if the, the conclusion is reached multiple times and experiment after experiment after experiment is going through and uh, demonstrating that the hypotheses are correct, that may lead to a scientific theory. All right. Now, there are very few theories in science. <coughs> theory of evolution, cell theory, um, uh, the, um, the Big Bang theory, there's, there's a few of them, um, but there's not really that many true theories in science. So let's start with this example, all right? Um, so we ask ourselves a question, you know? Um, we know somebody who, or, or an animal that uh, ended up with um, brain damage because of the use of cell phones. I mean, you see people on cell phones doing stupid things all the time. So this is really not a, um, a, a terrible hypothesis. You know, people walking out into the middle of the street without looking, tripping over things and, and that sort of thing, or just staring at the screen all day long. Um, in any event, do cell phones cause brain damage? And well, th my question to you is, how would we determine whether this was the case? Well, uh, first of all, doing experiments on humans is probably not all that ethical. As a matter of fact, you'd probably go to jail for doing this kind of thing. But you can get our furry little friend here, the, uh, the mouse or rat, uh, and use it in order to determine uh, the conclusions to our, uh, to our work. So how would we do this? Do we take one mouse, put it on a cell phone, and just leave it there and see if it eventually dies of Dane Bramage? No. All right. The more mice we can use or the more rats we can use, the better our results will be. Now, do we give all of the mice cell phones or expose them to cell phone radiation? Again, no. We need something that's called a control. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a large group of mice, maybe 100, let's say, and we're going to take 50 of them and we're going to put them in a room that's um, insulated against cell phone uh, uh, radiation. And then we're going to put the other 50 in a room and we're going to put a cell phone um, and have uh, the signal constantly being sent through the room. Now, Everything has to be the same in both groups, right? The same amount of food, same amount of water, same amount of bedding, same size cage, all right? You name it. The only difference is that the one over there is going to have cell phones in it and the one over there is not, all right? That's going to be the experimental and that's going to be the control. So we run this experiment for a couple hours, right? No, probably not, all right? Um, I'm thinking, I'm not sure what the average lifespan of a mouse is, but I can't imagine it's much more than a year or two. So I would say six months to a year is probably a reasonably good um, estimate here. And then we got to look at their brains. Now we could do this by x-ray. We could uh, sacrifice the mice and dissect out their brains and examine them that way. All right. I'm not sure what, honestly, I'm not a neurobiologist, so I'm not sure what the best way to determine this would be, but we'll figure out a way. But the same thing has to be done to every single mouse. And then we can see if there's a difference in their brains. Now, this leads um, to a couple of definitions that you should be aware of. Okay. Um, two things. First, variables. All right. There are two variables in a controlled study, the independent variable, which is sometimes called the experimental variable, is the one that we purposely change or manipulate. All right. The, the, um, the Mr. Anderson video, whoopsie daisy, the Mr. Anderson video that you just watched uh, talked about the independent variable as being the one that I manipulate. All right. The independent for the one that I change. Um, the dependent variable is the thing that we measure, all right? In this case, maybe we'll measure brain mass or uh, the size of the, of the um, uh, holes in the brain or, you know, what the size of the cancerous tumors in the brain, whatever it, it happens to be that we decided that we wanted to measure. Everything else, of course, remained constant, the amount of food, water, size of the cage, etc. 
the other variable that we need to talk about, I'm sorry, the other um, definition that we need to have here is groups, all right? There are two groups, the experimental group, sometimes called the test group, and this is the group of subjects that are exposed to the experimental variable. The mice over there are the ones that had, were exposed uh, to the cell phone radiation. And so those are the experimental uh, animals or the test animals. The ones over there were the ones that were not exposed to uh, the cell phone radiation. We call that group the control. And the importance of a control group is that they're there for comparison uh, to the experimental group, all right? Everything is the same between those two groups, except that the control group is not uh, exposed to the experimental variable, right? In this case, cell phone radiation. <coughs> okay. Now, how do you get your information about science, all right? Well, if you turn on the TV and listen to a politician, you're not getting any real scientific information. The best source for scientific information is a scientific journal, which is essentially a magazine published usually monthly, although some come out quarterly, some even come out weekly. Um, but scientific journals are considered to be the best source of information, um, but they can be very difficult for somebody who is not a scientist, right? It, difficult to understand. And so most often people in, uh, who are not scientists uh, will read secondary sources. They'll go to the newspaper or the internet um, or, um, you know, a, a magazine perhaps, right? Unfortunately, you got to remember that the articles that are written by uh, the folks in these sources, those folks are not uh, scientists either. And so you are reading what their interpretation of the information is. And you have to be very careful that you're not taking that information out of context, all right? Meaning that, uh, you know, the author is putting his or her own slant on the information as opposed to talking about it objectively. Uh, if you're using the internet, you have to be very careful of information um, that does not have a reliable URL. All right, the, the most reliable ones are the ones that end in .edu, uh, .gov, and .org. You should be aware of anecdotal data. All right, um, you know if if uh, you know your neighbor tells you that her great aunt Joni, um, you know, died of of um, coronavirus because she had fungus on her toenails, um, that's not real science, all right? That's an anecdote. That's a story told by one person to another. And you should never take anecdotal data as uh, serious scientific evidence. You should be able to understand the methodology and the results of the experiment. What did the scientists do and what did they find? Um, and then ask yourself, does the the uh, conclusion is is the conclusion justified by the data that they collected, or is there possibly some other explanation that you can uh, come up with here? A good uh, educated consumer will be able to re read a graph, all right, know what the x-axis and y-axis mean, and be able to interpret the data that are exposed or shown in that graph and have a small understanding, at least, of statistical analysis, all right? Now, not all of these things are going to be um, tools in your uh, toolkit, but um, the more of these that you can uh, live by, the better off that you'll be. Now, I put this slide up because uh, it's near and dear to my own uh, heart, um, but this slide illustrates that science is self-correcting. Um, in 1998, a guy by the name of Dr. Andrew Wakefield published a study in a British medical journal called The Lancet, and he claimed that he had found a, uh, a connection between vaccines and autism. Now, both of my sons have mild cases of autism, and so, uh, and they were born in 2006, eight years after this study um, was published. And almost as soon as it was published, it, it uh, raced around the country and people started not vaccinating their children, all right? 
The study had some problems, however. It was, wasn't based on statistical analysis. There was no control group. It relied on people's memories. They literally called up parents and, and uh, asked them questions. Um, and it made vague conclusions that weren't statistically valid. And so in 1999, there was a study of nine, uh, sorry, 500 children uh, be, that tried to find a link between vaccines and um, autism, and there was no link. In 2001, a study of 10,000 children, no link. In 2002, a study of 537,000 children, no connection was found, all right? And so on and so on and so on, okay? No link to autism was found in any study, any study, in any case, all right? And so the Lancet was eventually forced to issue a, um, uh, a statement refuting the original findings, okay? Saying that it just wasn't true, but it's too late. The damage is now done because there are a lot of people out there who uh, still believe that vaccines cause autism. And so um, they're not vaccinating their kids. And now we've got kids running around with measles and uh, German measles and, and all sorts of other diseases that were literally wiped out in the United States because their parents will no longer vaccinate them. All right. My triplets are vaccinated uh, for everything that they could be vaccinated for at this point. Um, and be because this is a, an important health issue, all right? Never so more, never more so than now with this coronavirus nonsense going around, all right? If we can come up with a good vaccine, uh, that will give the country immunity against this disease, but only if everybody gets the vaccine. Now, I personally don't know if that will come anytime soon, but I'm hoping that it will because I really hate teaching remotely. Anyway, that is the end of my discussion of chapter one. I hope you enjoyed and we'll move on to chapter two next.